thanks to the organizers for organizing this really timely conference, uh, which is really much needed, especially with what's happening right now. And uh, thank you to everybody here who's made it uh, made an effort to be part of this. And I know it can lead to enormous amounts of fatigue. So I hope we can have more of a conversation. I notice we have a one and a half hours. So I hope it's not just me talking and we can actually, these are propositions which we could then enter into and engage because a lot of what I'm going to introduce here are really thoughts that are, are in process and formulating, especially with what's happening with the pandemic and the pressures to rethink what constitutes as global implications on uh, datafication, automation, and can we go beyond these binaries, really? So yeah, let me get started. Um, so obviously what I'm gonna be doing here is less about the journalistic angle and much more about embedding journalism within a larger sort of rubric of what constitutes as automation and data-driven uh, frameworks, right? And for us to think this through because many industries, not just journalism, is embedded in these dynamics and are shaped and are being shaped by them. And they're also intertwining with other unlikely actors as I'll reveal. So much of my talk is drawn from my book, which stems from almost two decades actually of fieldwork experience in low-income communities, uh, much of it in India, but also in uh, Brazil, South Africa, Namibia, and of course, secondary research in rich ethnographies across the world. And the big driver for my book was trying to gauge to what extent are users in basically communities in low income contexts, in the extraordinarily different contexts and their conditions, different from you and I in our, their user behavior in the consumption, production of content and the distribution of it, right? And uh, the quick answer is not that different in the core elements of what they seek for. We are very much you know, similar in those regards because we have joint aspirations for fair representation, for visibility, for self-actualization, for passion, entertainment. So in those uh, regards, we need to see us as a sort of a joint humanity. On the other hand, there are behavioral shifts and techniques and the nature of content, which does get influenced by the contextual matters. And that's what I am gonna unpack, particularly in regards to the larger systems within which these practices are embedded. So what has been very interesting for me in the last year and a half, since the book has been released is, you know, it is not coincidence that uh, I had a number of the usual suspects from Google, Microsoft, Intel, uh, Facebook approach me and open up dialogue, including telecom companies, and also I've been now talking to financial investors. So very different kinds of companies. And um, you would say that's also spawned some very unusual actors reaching out to me from solar energy companies trying to get Africa to uh, agricultural, global agricultural firms where I have to always step back and say, why are you reaching me? And then I start to, you know, unpack a lot of it is being automated, digitized, and they're trying to get farmers into the mainstream of their business model. And they want to know how they think. And they're using a lot of this kind of content of how the farmer is a new entrepreneur and to get it part of the news imagination, right? So anyway, so as I unravel it, it is very much a fact that while I've been doing this for my entire research career since my master's day, looking into low income communities, and I was extraordinarily discouraged, by the way, because it was considered something which is not going to help you in your citations. Uh, that was one of the big things is, oh, you know, you're doing something which is very marginal. Even though, of course, by sheer number, we are the, we're talking about the majority, the norm, right? So it's margins in terms of power and there's layers of power, right? Academic power. And as many of you also know, that's very much 
still the place whether you go through review systems where you have to create explanations and added paragraphs of why your context why should it matter but you're really trying to convince often anglo-saxon reviewers that that will somehow be relevant to the say american or european or whatnot context so there is this need for the push for the sort of decolonizing of academia and you know education there's also this idea of this is not our business. Let's reform whether it's policy or regulation. Let's look at the information systems within Europe or within the Netherlands or within America. Whereas actually these are information ecosystems as I will uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, unpack with you all, which intuitively you all know because you're doing this kind of work is it goes across board and we need to think in global terms and think in terms of the intersecting of different global actors from the very you know entire process of this journalistic system so you know um i obviously used it as a sort of a bait to companies by titling it the next billion users because that was exactly the time when spotify came up with their next billion user lab uh, so did google and actually, if you do, a, I, I try to optimize the algorithm. So if you actually do next billion users, you see Google and my books side by side. So if they're going to try to commodify these users, I hope they start to look at it in terms of, you know, actual engagements going on at the ground level. And I have to say it works. So um, look, it's not unusual that this has become of high interest to corporations because in this data driven age, Today now we can't even get about writing a grant without you know I, I was just talking to a team uh, yesterday on a Horizon 2020 grant and we we're like oh we really need to still put this AI you know uh, like discrimination using AI even though actually discrimination is far more than that and even without AI obviously these sort of discrimination practices and recruitment will still happen. But we have to have these sort of signals, right? Uh, a few years ago, it was big data. You know, every every other time, we need to use the right language or digital humanities, or you learn the proposal speak. But the fact remains is that it has suddenly got a lot of attention because, at least from the business side, these are actual, you know, uh, legitimate, uh, you know, uh, target groups because they literally are the fuel for the so-called rocket ship of AI, as a number of Google CEOs have literally expressed the era we are in, right? So these are basically data points. And by sheer numbers, as they consume and they go online, they are basically generating enormous amounts of data, which can be channeled to sort of spearhead and use technologies, which can be geared and serviced towards the West. So, um, so the five propositions, you know, just like because I like to keep things simple, I like the sort of A, B, C, D, E kind of, you know, get basic, get elemental propositions to consider when we unpack automation data driven systems are architectures, behaviors, collectives, design values and e content. And the what I'm basically throwing this and I'm going to come up with a number of you know, key concepts that are shifted and could actually be recalibrated differently with the Global South in mind as we look into each of these conversations. And I would like to also highlight what are the normative conversations going on because the West is still part, the core part of the imagination in terms of concerns, aspirations, and the kinds of content and, uh, you know, uh, procedures that go through. So, Let's get started with basically architectures. Okay, so as we know, there is, you know, it's next billion users didn't just come about, it was stimulated by some very disruptive innovations in particularly in the global south, for instance, geo, possibly one of the biggest attributors to this uh, mobile uptake. So, you know, cheap mobile phones in itself has been a pioneering resource for uh, a lot of the world's low income communities getting online for the first time, right? 
And then on top of it, cheap data plans, extraordinarily cheap data plans. We're talking about for 20 cents a GB versus say, say eight euros here or $15 in the US. So this created a huge opportunity where you know millions of people have come on board. And uh, GEO, of course, has been celebrated as an indigenous Indian, you know, innovation, right? Because it is from one of the classic oligarchs of India, you know, Reliance and the billionaire Ambani behind it. But if we start to unpack the architecture behind it, it is, of course, in, uh, you know, in concert with Disney and Facebook. And it, you know, there is a much more global uh, a conglomeration behind the sort of uh, release. But that being said, their focus and the way in which they've even created outreach is very much, you know, with the year to the ground, right? So uh, it's one of the first companies to legitimately recognize that users, these next billion users are not exotic, that they are basically utility driven, which is something that I co-argue in my book at, a, at the core basis is that stop looking at them at you, as utility driven entities because they are very much like you and I, which means that you need to actually try to engage with them. So you don't create instrumental news because it won't be clicked. You don't create content that is just descriptive or is supposed to be very useful for say example, women for reproduction and how to contain themselves in terms of family planning, which is very neo-colonial. You know, how do we like reduce that, you know, kind of population control, very Maslow. And then you have, of course, uh, the idea of the Global South users need to be actually uh, uplifting themselves in a poverty and making sure that they do economic oriented uh, consumption of content, right? So it has to be for jobs, etc. So what Geo found is much of what they actually consumed in terms of use their precious data was for you know leisure purposes, as I've been arguing. And that being, they even came up with the ABCD principle that much of what Indians actually consume is for towards astrology content, Bollywood. That's A, B, C for cricket, and D for devotion. And if you, that was majority of it. And if you can find a way to embed your content within that or the confluence of that, you will be visible, right? So that, you know, enters into this term choice architectures, which is basically the way in which, you know, design features are presented to the user to influence their decision making. And one has to actually factor these sort of in you know uh, contextual uh, drivers and how in spite of AB, the ABCD principles and in spite of these private companies ready and open-minded much of academia generates utility driven research much of journalism is about how do we you know create useful news for this population that they can use and empower them in a very development framework. We don't look at them as complex, holistic beings. So, um, you know, and another two uh, sort of sub kind of terms that needs to be also thought about is these notions of affordances, right? Like affordances of based on, you know, the features available on a platform, you know, how you're able to engage, how long you stay on a platform is all about small little features that are introduced that shift the way in, you, in which you participate, right? So even something as uh, simple as a like button is an affordance to participate in a minimal way and as well as to data capture for companies uh, alike. Nudges are a way to sort of steer them through, well, because if you see the afford, the choices of, well, you need to express yourself, you don't need to, but you feel compelled to because it is visible in front of you. So you have a smiley face, you have a dislike uh, button. And uh, basically they even uh, sort of debated the sort of dislike versus like button because do they want to create a negative culture around this kind of experience or positive culture? So these are aspects, very rudimentary, but very essential, uh, humble characteristics that can shape communication. Then we go into a much more ambitious sort of uh, conversation, which is that 
and that is a conversation which is very rich and entrenched in platform capitalism. A number of works, much of many of you have also covered it, is about recognizing that these are not just affordance or design features. Behind that are social political, uh, you know, interests that are drivers that shape that, particularly also corporate and commercial interests, right? So as I've already explained about the, the harvesting of data for third party users and marketing of, uh, you know, uh, of certain kinds of content, the network effects where the rich get richer, the loser, there are winners and losers, which have clearly yielded in hyper monopolization of certain platforms. So the notion of sort of choice architectures is almost an oxymoron because actually choice is far less towards from the user perspective and much more from the design perspective of what choices do they want you to have, right? And how do they want to steer you in that kind of consumption behavior? And then we expand that to a larger conversation on the infrastructural turn. So in recent years, there's a conversation saying that, well, platform capitalism is not sufficient to capture the larger patterns going on, right? And that being the infrastructural turn, which is about scale and indispensability. In which case, it is no longer just a company, it becomes a public utility service. This is very clearly felt in the massive, you know, showdown between the Australian government and Facebook and Google, right? Where Google, Facebook said, well, all right, I'm gonna stop uh, because it's all right, I'm gonna just stop it. And there was absolute furor, like, you know, an anger towards Facebook because much of the conversation, much of the social services around the pandemic, these were essential services that were built upon Facebook, right? So, and of course this happened for those who may have missed this is that it happened because Australia wanted to get Facebook and Google to pay the fair share to journalist publishers basically and journalist content producers. And uh, because you have a failing industry in terms of they are losing revenue at a rapid rate and Facebook, as many of you know, uh, the, some companies that have done uh, extraordinarily well are the, these platform companies in the pandemic uh, crisis, right? In fact, their profits have risen uh, by, you know, in enormous fold. So what what is interesting is Facebook continues to claim it's not a publishing uh, entity, but it is a mere platform. This sort of lingo is crucial because basically as long as they claim they're not a publishing entity, they do not have to subscribe to journalistic norms, codes. They're not responsible for the content that is on their platform in theory. But in practice, as we have seen collective push, the collective gun to companies' heads, the sort of pressure from across the globe in this kind of outrage actually can shift design uh, features, can actually shift business practices, but it's not a sustainable strategy, isn't it? Because we can't continue doing this. It has to be also top down. We can't just put the burden on users and activists and you know agencies and NGOs that are already overburdened to regulate something so massive and so essential for our democracies. So, you know, this battle continues, but it becomes even more perverse in the global context, global South context, because as we notice that Facebook and other big, you know, the, uh, the FAMGA and the, the basically the big oligarchs uh, are able to create in the name of respect, different standards for different countries. For example, with WhatsApp, they recently released it in India, well, they don't have to adhere to any privacy regulations because, well, even though India is in its top five countries as a, with the most number of users for Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, right? So even though these are massive markets, they're capitalizing on a weak state that cannot enforce these laws where privacy regulations and privacy rule of law, law has only recently been, you know, uh, endorsed by the Supreme Court and is yet to come up with a, institution of enforcement, right? 
So they call it, well, we respect the national laws, which in the global south, majority of them either don't have privacy and data regulation laws or have very weak or have a kind of cut and paste system, but not an enforcement mechanism, right? And in the meantime, they, of course, in Europe, they actually had to write, they could not share uh, their regulations for WhatsApp, uh, uh, sharing of the data with Facebook was allowed was not allowed because of privacy uh, considerations, right? So they were allowed to do the sort of dualistic sort of a uh, double standard and you see this practice quite often and this is why we need to particularly focus on the global south because these are then become specifically contextual and regional okay so and we can talk more about it later and let me go into a bigger now so I'm, I'm literally from the design to platforms to infrastructures and now media ecologies which is that it is in you know i don't know if some of you remember you know this is maybe also revealing my age is like Bush saying that, oh yeah, he made a sort of grammatical mistake when the internet came out and he said, oh, I love the internet. And there's all these like jokes about how stupid he is that he came up with internets. And guess what? We actually now have multiple internets, right? We have the Russian internet, we have the Chinese internet. There is a sort of sovereign internet. And this is in the name of decolonization, in the name of you know, uh, sovereignty, of national pride, these sort of specific architectures are coming up, which is basically whether it's in India, China, China has a firewall, Russia has their own sort of sensor versions where you cannot use certain apps. Uh, now, India is even pushing for data localization, which is basically about you have to keep the data within, which, and they have to have access to that which basically in today's climate in India with the rising authoritarianism is that it allows them to also police journalists. And we have seen the uh, terrible track record in the last year of journalists or even actually these amateur, uh, you know, shall we say, like I say, next billion user journalists, when I say that, I mean that by just retweeting, you can get into a criminal offense. And as you've seen many cases in India for just retweeting a content, they have been you know, slapped with uh, a sort of a criminal a record and jail time. And it has, this is continues till today, right? So um, this makes this conversation very pertinent for looking at a media eco ecosystem. And that also means that we need to consider that it's not just about digital, the digital, it's also about the mainstream or traditional, uh, you know, uh, media systems. And we shouldn't pretend that they are frozen. They're actually very alive and kicking in the global south. It, it, it typically tends, maybe it's part of the academic nature that what is overwritten about, we pretend that it is the past, right? Because nobody wants to read more about television you know, in a sense, in a conventional way or radio without talking about podcasts. So, like it's always the, there has to be the, the contemporary, but the reality in many of these contexts, for example, a case in, uh, I did a three year uh, collaboration in Namibia about news consumption, and it still continues to be one person coming from a village, going to the town once in maybe a few days, clicking a photo on, off uh, certain parts of newspapers and then sending it on by via SMS to the rest of the village. And this is the sort of illustration of how, uh, you know, traditional media, like a simple thing like a newspaper is considered a luxury in the context of Namibia. However, not so much in say in the context of India. In India, television is pretty omnipresent not so in Namibia, it's a luxury there and far fewer have access. So even within the global South, there's specific sort of mainstreams which are looked upon as luxury and also very pluralistic. Like India has a vibrant television network of hundreds of channels and constantly dynamic and they are closely aligned with the digital. So you can't not see them, right? And then of course you have, you know, the notion of this ecosystem as ecosystem, right? And to what degree is it sort of um, perpetuating the same kinds of conversations and ideas? And this is because it is reinforced 
And, you know, because a typical user will see if it's coming from multiple sources, but what happens when you have Facebook that also owns WhatsApp and Instagram that appears like three different sources, three different channels are reinforcing the same news item. And then on top of it, you have a regular television or radio or which also reinforces, even though they're very much in alignment, right? Often television channels are actually party-based, like a political party is funding it and actually it's because it's a propaganda machine. So you can't not see the larger system for us to understand uh, what certain contents and consumption mean and distribution means, right? All right, so, um, just checking the time. All right, so the next aspect is about behaviors. And, uh, you know, so I've always advocated for looking at them in through a three lens because in leisure, labor, and learning. And the reason being is they all three have a role to play and they come together in very important ways. Now, my previous book on the leisure commons was about, you know, making a case for the internet being a leisure commons much like the urban commons from the 1800s, which is meant to be, you know, for the public, uh, by the public, right? And it was not meant to be uh, owned. It was meant to be open. And, you know, this was a part of the whole Californian ideology too. But in practice, it has actually not played out that way. But to a high degree, we actually get much of our leisure consumption. In fact, particularly in the global south, the internet is the main leisure platform because there's very few uh, spaces where they can have time off because you can just picture something like this, a person sitting with uh, in an auto rickshaw, you know, or a tuk-tuk for 10 to 14 hours or in today's terms, o o Ola Uber drivers in say South Africa, they told me they're round the clock they work and then they sleep in their cabs and, you know, they want to make sure they don't, uh, you know, they're basically imprisoned by the algorithmic system and penalty system of Uber or and Ola and the like, ride sharing economy, which is a whole different conversation. So when do they get their leisure time is because they have to extract it during that time. And the best is through mobile phones and through the sort of like they get on the internet and consume, maybe share a joke, you know, get on WhatsApp, you know, chat with someone, romance, et cetera. And that's when they start to read, that's when they start to consume messages through memes and alike, right? So um, also leisure historically, and we have to look at it as when we look at journalism, much of journalism is embedded, not in terms of trivializing uh, leisure because um, leisure has a deep political history because as we know that the future of journalism is deeply precarious and particularly in this rising authoritarianism that we are experiencing in majority of the countries. In fact, the, uh, a democratic state is uh, not the norm actually, less than five, according to The Economist now, less than 5% of the countries today are actually liberal democracies right? Less than 5%. And yet, if you just open any of the so-called regular legitimate or credible or even elite channels uh, uh, and media outlets, it appears as if that is the norm and that how we need to preserve it from the margins, you know, and it really has to be flipped. It's like we have to ask ourselves, why is that the case? And so knowing that the enormous amounts of precarity and vulnerability for journalists, for the sector of journalism in the first place, right? That leisure becomes an extraordinarily important space because of the good old cute cat theory, as many of you know from the classic, you know, um, Zuckerman. Uh, I always, you know, now I have Zuckerberg's name in my head, but anyway, but uh, which basically said it is harder to censor an entire platform when people are using it mostly for uh, so-called mundane purposes, like, oh, I'm sh sharing a, a photo of my cat, right? And as you know, cat videos, cat content is a number one consumption on say YouTube and like, and so that's really an interesting 
so he called it the cute cat theory, and it has sort of reinvigorated uh, itself, as we see in some beautiful work coming out from Chinese internet studies work, where they embed uh, strong journalistic pieces in say romance sites, you know, in the Alibaba ecosystem. So you click on it and you start to, you know, chat for dating purposes, and then you have much more political commentary through vlogging online. So you have to, it's like hidden within plain sight. And this is the way in which you need to uh, get an audience. Or so in Russia, YouTube has become one of the most prime ways in which you can really create outreach and legitimacy, right? Trust. Um, Another example I want to bring up is something that I, I almost fell for is this, um, I was reading the other day, I actually got, uh, I think a family member of mine, of course, uh, I shared it on, uh, you know, for my, I think it's my father, he shares a lot of crap, I mean, with me, like 20, 30 videos a day. And I think I fell for one of these because I trust him, you know, because of some sort of uh, socializing from childhood. <laughs> anyway, so it said, okay, it said Forbes, and it says China officially backs a cryptocurrency and establishes it as their official coin. I clicked on it. It literally had the front of Forbes. Like it looked like the proper Forbes website. And I read it and it then gave instructions saying that, okay, you can actually invest in this. It's only 18 cents and it gave you a guidelines. And it if you do that, you know, because and I started to think that makes sense because China will not let it fail. And I got convinced. I'm like, you know what? Let me just do, put in 250 euros. Just like, let me just play the game. So I literally clicked on it. And then I immediately got a call, which raised my suspicions. Then why am I getting a call from someone? And it says Dublin. And anyway, so in the meantime, my partner did some research about it. And it said, scam, 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 scam. And I'm like, oh, shit. And I disconnected, but I've been getting calls from London, Berlin, Sweden. And so now they have my number. And then if you look closely, it says paid program, right? So, so actually it's, it wasn't fake. It's actually was paid on Forbes. So that is gets even more perverse. So you have, of course, the actual fake news, which is completely misleading. And then you have paid because of the way in which the industry is today, that they are starving for cash, that they allow news, uh, news items as ads, right? And you can actually pay for, you know, distributing updates on certain situations. So, and then you have the third aspect is learning. For us to understand behaviors, we have to understand no such thing as a frozen user behavior. It is always in progress and it's situated learning, right? Which is peer to peer learning, like the Lave and Wegner, like we need to reach into the whole educational realm of informal, you know, community learning. Because that's how nobody has a sort of cheat sheet on how to, how do you get away from scammers or how do you recognize? Because everything is dynamic, very much like the actor network theory, right? Of Latour, that it is constantly in process. There is no such thing as a finished news item. It is in process because it is always the release to create a sort of a larger dialogue and circulation. All right, so third is about collectivities. And all right, so is that we, we can't obviously can't see users as individuals. And in fact, with datafication, there's no such thing as an individual. When we even use the term personalization, it's not personalizing to you, it's personalizing to your type of person right? Because you're always clustered as part of a group. And that's really important to understand because that comes in play with who gets to shape these boundaries of user groups, right? So, you know, and I think this is an invitation for you all to explore the number of ways in which they have been framed from more, you know, from historically mobs and, you know, uh, as these mindless mobs and masses to, to you know then we flipped when the web 2.0 came and said oh collective intelligence wisdom of the crowd and now we're like hang on we're not on one extreme or the other extreme we're more of well we need we know that there are certain target groups and certain target groups can be very powerful and empowering right that hence hence hashtags hashtag activism from me too and can generate and push people to reporting on certain kinds of uh, items right which normally doesn't get the space in a uh, typical mainstream 
uh, news outlet. On the other hand, it can also be trolling cultures, right? The vigilantism, or like in, in India, the internet Hindus, um, where they're out to sort of preserve a certain kind of script, a narrative, and they want to reinforce the narrative and they make an item stronger than ever before. They are like the army to sort of emphasize why certain content is more important than others. And that can steer the sort of bandwidth, the space, the front lines, the way in which it gets calibrated, right? So, um, and then of course, you know, you have the sort of digital humanitarians, right? These sort of citizen journalists and some of you are already doing wonderful work in that. And so this is not new to you, but uh, you know, the idea that they are looked upon as digital humanitarians, but there's a thin line between them as journalists being harvested because the fact is that many people can't go to the ground level. So they're not, are they voluntarily journalists? Are they actively journalists? Are they just reporting because they're actually capturing for justice, for example, a little snippet of reality and what we as journalists at, at the outside, you know, at the, bring these narratives together, these little snippets to create a narrative. And as you know, the sort of pastiche can go either way, right? And thereby you have pl a pluralistic of stories, the whole sort of post-truth uh, dilemma. And then the fourth aspect we need to look at in the D is design values on ethics, principles, and manifestos. So we're not looking, so on one hand, we recognize that, you know, the platform, the design, the platforms, infrastructures, and ec ecosystems. On the other hand, we also should recognize the momentum that is being spearheaded to regulate and to shape and to rethink how it should be designed, right? So GDPR was, you know, it, despite a number of its flaws, one of the most uh, commendable collective efforts, at least, to at least try to rethink a system where, where the citizen interest comes instead of a user interest. Like it's less about seeing, commodifying a user and protecting them in terms of their rights, actually. So it definitely is something that has been commendable. However, in uh, I do critique it in my work because the European imagination does not seem to uh, look at pluralistic context and privacy by design, actually one should be very suspicious when Facebook starts to celebrate it and says, we are a privacy first organization. We love GDPR. In fact, a lot of them came and said, fabulous, the big oligarchs, because why? They can actually adhere to these policies and most importantly for Facebook, they don't need to actually curate or actually be accountable to the content because they respect the privacy behind the uh, the um, the walled gardens of WhatsApp and encrypted platforms, you know, uh, such as uh, even in, with WeChat, right? So, um, so encrypted platforms are the godsend for uh, the platforms like Facebook because that's where news can circulate, and we will have no idea what is being said, what is being distributed. And it is all in the name of a good value of privacy. So I argue in one of my papers is privacy is not absolute, it is relational, especially when we look into the global south, because visibility is far more important in many of these contexts, which will, uh, you will understand why, and many of you already do that, why people take these extraordinary risks to be visible, to be heard, knowing that their life is at the front line because that matters more to them than actually, you know, the continued injustice of the system, right? Then there's this, uh, you know, a momentum on ethical design, right? But, you know, about a sort of a respect-based framework, but that's also come under critique because ethics without enforcement does not matter that much because in fact, there's this whole discourse about ethics washing, right? Because all these uh, platforms can come up with ethical boards of what's the right thing to do versus real regulation, right? And then you have these uh, a feminist design, feminist internet, feminist AI, and a whole uh, load of uh, reports. And while that's again commendable, I'm, I've got a special issue coming out about fe uh, cross-cultural femtech, it, uh, which actually pushes against this because if you look at feminist uh, manifest now, it's all these top scholars who happen to be 
uh, and they claim to be intersectional, but they almost all of them are residing in the United States and they're white women. So, and a few, so there's very few, uh, a majority of them still are exactly the opposite of what constitutes as intersectional feminism. And while they are phenomenal scholars and I actually respect them, it needed to actually, you know, uh, play out in a way that they actually stand for, right? Which is being genuinely inclusive. So last wrap up is basically the e-content is the, you know, the nature of content is really important. And here's a sort of a good illustration. You have, you know, the China's 13th 30, five-year plan came out, which was in the newspapers. It was if basically the vision, right? And they even used a promotional video on YouTube, which had an American voice behind it. And it was done in English and not Chinese. So it was obviously for a global audience. And then you had a lot of responses towards it, like these sort of like uh, gifts, like give me five and, you know, the sort of communist uh, sort of visual, but there was, this is a very thin line as I, uh, you know, of irony is a satire because a number of them are making fun of this Chinese plan. On the other hand, it may not be satire. It's actually reinforcing their sort of respect for the Com communist party. And that sort of gray area is why it is so hard to automate and regulate the meaningfulness of certain kind of content, right? And we see numerous examples, and we can go into that, whether it's, you know, nudity on Facebook. And so, you know, the sort of curation is gonna be a conversation which we'll be looking at far more. And, you know, we, we need to start thinking in terms of the everyday aesthetics about, uh, because it's, it's content, especially in the global South, where you have semi-literate populations, uh, limited sort of, uh, time to read through, you know, and especially uh, a lot of text which is not in their local languages, the visual medium, the video me medium has become most dominant. In fact, I consulted with KPMG a year and a half ago, and what I found which was astounding was that it said that the highest consumption of video content came from the lowest socioeconomic group, in spite of the fact that this is so expensive for them. Now that should say something to us, right? So, and now if you look at the way podcasts are going, in the, the in fact, there are a number of next billion user podcasts, which are targeted, basically it's an offshoot of a design team that I'm working with, uh, that comes from uh, Geo actually, which is the mobile platform, where they said, instead of actually adding them on later, we put them at the heart of design because they are going to change podcasts like never before. That's where they're going to get their news from. That's where they're going to have their opinions being shaped because you can listen to it. You can do multiple things. You can ride your rickshaw. You can do many things. It can be in your own languages also. So anyway, this is something we need to start to look at in terms of affect, you know, coming together in terms of multimodality of text from media text to practice, where as Ashwin uh, uh, and other scholars have brought up about listening cultures, not just, you know, the visual culture, but we need to shift into listening cultures as a, um, anyway, so I, I do want to, there's a number of things I want to say, but I just for the sake of time and I want to open it up, uh, I will wrap up here and talk about just to say that decolonizing journalism is really essential because we do need to shift perspective. And I know that people would critique it and say, why do you use the term Western? versus non-Western because it becomes a sort of regional context and we should speak in terms of imperial powers actually. You know, it should be because technically the imperial, those who have the control and those who do not. So it could then be like, for example, companies function like states, right? Like a uh, Facebook is a sort of a transnational actor but it is even more sometimes powerful than the state. But that being said, the, the term of Western does to hold ground to some regards because of the colonial histories, which are not dead, unfortunately. In fact, the broadcast laws in many of these countries come from colonial laws, which basically embedded sedition laws, where if you speak against authority, you can be imprisoned for disrupting harmony. That comes from colonial laws from the British, Dutch, 
you know, uh, and a variety of others, and it continues to be alive in the legal systems. So in short, colonialism is not dead, but has been reconstituted in many of the everyday institutions, including broadcasting laws. And we need to then see it in those terms. And worse yet, this power still continues to rest tremendously in terms of wealth, in terms of you know, uh, the, the data accumulation themes, in terms of the way in which data has been harnessed and the way in which applications are being uh, sought, where these companies are based, you know, um, and where the tax is being paid. So anyway, so that's still, these boundaries still matter. And I definitely encourage you guys to start moving from an interdisciplinary to an anti-disciplinary uh, approach. Because as you see that I had to touch, my books have touched architecture, history. Like if you look at uh, uh, aesthetics, you, 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 there's so much to learn in art history. If you look at archival uh, uh, archives, history is a wonderful teacher or you know, um, software studies. Uh, for understanding uh, choice architectures, actually the real, the architectural field itself. So urban planning to understand the way in which you plan systems. So, you know, I think follow your question and be uh, sort of, um, you know, irreverent towards disciplines because I think that's the only way we can really come up with original thinking, especially if we need that kind of thinking to break out of what we are in and sort of a trap of, maybe even academic as well as uh, obviously the larger political economy of academia, right? And then of course, move into start thinking to, from automated to assistive technologies, because there's no such thing as a, automated has a sort of connotation that it is replacing. And actually few of it in reality is a replacement, but more of an assistive to certain kinds of agendas, people, uh, you know, and processes. So I think it's much more useful as a tool. Um, there is a shift now from data-driven to communicative-driven, you know? Uh, so people are like, well, after all, when you say data, it, it sort of sidelines the fact that what data is, is a lot of our everyday communicative practices. So we need to put communication at the center. And I would even push that further and say, well, value-driven is what do we want to hold dear? What kinds of universal values can we go into a rights-based values? Can we use that as a template to then move backwards? And last is when we look at this as an intersectionality by design, let's recognize that we need to also look at what are the, we don't need to throw the bathwater, uh, baby with the bathwater, right? It's like we have good journalistic codes then how do they engage with ethical codes and feminist codes? Because it seems like as if you're inventing everything from scratch, especially when I talk to programmers, they're like, yes, I'm gonna come up with ethical AI for the journalists, uh, you know, journalists as if they didn't have any codes to live by. So I think that would be very useful because we know that it's a continuum and not some kind of innovation that is starting now, right? And with that, I will stop. Here are some resources there in academia, and I'm happy to share with you if you're interested, and I will stop.